Hey guys, ECRG here, back with another episode. The title of today's episode is The Best Clinical Research Jobs of 2021. So these are the best jobs that you should apply for in 2021. And so we're going to go ahead and get into that. But before we do, I just want to let you guys know about the resume review program, interview preparation, and career consultation options we have going on right now. So you can email me for more information, eliteclinicalgroup at gmail.com. Now, a lot of uh, those things are going to come into play later on in this episode because we've, we're going over the best clinical research jobs of 2021. And for a lot of these jobs, they're going to be incredibly, incredibly competitive. So you want to make sure you're putting your best foot forward. And the best way to do that is to have me review your resume, uh, do interview prep with me, and even how to even get in consideration for these things is you got to have the right clinical research applying strategy. So we go over all those things in our one-on-one -on -one session and our one-on-one -on -one times. So just want to get out, get that out the way early. Now we're going to go ahead and get in to the best clinical research jobs of 2021. So this, how is this list different than previous lists? So this list is taking the pandemic into consideration. This list is also taking into what's currently in the job market right now. So I'm literally looking on my phone on indeed.com, which is my preferred uh, place to look for jobs. Um, not to say that the other ones are bad or worse, but indeed is my preferred. Um, and I'm looking there and I'm looking at these jobs. So they're literally on indeed.com right now, probably if, at the time of when you're listening to this. So let's go ahead and get into it. The first job I found is, and this is the best clinical research jobs for entry-level people. The best one is going to be the bridge program for entry-level CRAs. And this is from PRA, which is a CRO. Now I would say, you know, you know this is not quote unquote, the most entry level job because they do require some clinical research experience, but it's well, they, they require some clinical experience, not clinical research experience. Um, this is for like old nurses, old military personnel um, who are looking to kind of transition into clinical research. And they, that's why it's called the bridge program because it's a bridge b between another field and getting into clinical research. And they put you in a clinical research associate job, which is not an entry level position by any means. Uh, we've talked about that exclu uh, extensively on the channel that CRA is not an entry-level role. So that's one of the great programs. And if you get into that program, you'd be foolish to turn it down. Um, and, and this first tier of jobs is really like the, the highest, highest uh, tier. This is like, you know, you basically just printed gold um, type of jobs. Uh, if you're able to land these jobs without any experience, like hats off to you. And this is extremely, extremely rare. But like I said, we're going to start from the best and we're going to kind of go all down uh, the list here. So one of the next in that first tier jobs is we've got a college hire uh, clinical research associate job um, from Johnson & Johnson, actually. So Johnson & Johnson, huge pharmaceutical company. They do lots and lots of research um, worth billions and billions of dollars. Um, they have a college hire clinical research associate. So they're looking for someone just out of college to make a CRA. So you want to look for these type of jobs if you're looking to be a CRA. They're very, very competitive. These are the most competitive jobs because so many people realize, hey, I can be a CRA right out of college without having to do all the other uh, jobs in between. Um, so these jobs are very, very competitive. And for sure, if you're planning on applying to one of these jobs, you want to make sure that your resume is uh, reviewed and you want to make sure that if you get an interview that you will have done a lot of interview preparation. Um, obviously, we do that also and are able to probably help you the best, but you definitely want to make sure you're well prepared. Another job that is good is the, just a plain old CRA1 job. So if you want to be a CRA, um, you can look at the CRA1 job, and that's typically your, you know, your base model CRA. That's where everyone typically starts as a CRA. Um, sometimes they, have, they post those jobs and they don't require a lot of experience, less than a year, about a year. So sometimes you may get lucky and um, you may be able to apply to one or you may just get lucky and they may be able to uh, make you into a CRA. So look out for those jobs, CRA one jobs. Once again, these are all first tier jobs. If you land these jobs, um, hats off to you because these are incredible and extremely difficult to get. Less than 1% of people um, are able to get these jobs without any experience. And then the next job, and this is the last of the first tier jobs, is going to be your entry-level CRA job from MedPace. Now, if you don't know how I feel about MedPace, you want to go watch my Glassdoor review episode on MedPace. 
um, and you can kind of get to know how I feel about them. They do, they do have entry level CRA jobs, which no experience. And if you notice, they're one of the only companies that does this and there's a reason for it. Um, but we're not going to go into that in this episode, but if you get one of these jobs, it's a great job to start out in. And, um, they do try and keep you there, uh, through legal methods, um, very, very shady things with the non-compete and stuff like that for someone making so little money. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, once again, I'm not going to get into it too deeply. Um, but if you are able to be made a CRA at MedPace, you can do it. Um, and if you do end up getting, uh, making, being made to sign a non-compete agreement, there are ways in which you can leave. Um, so I would look into that. Um, and, you know, don't be too afraid about it. I've heard of people saying it's, it's mostly bark, not too much bite for CRAs. Um, you know, I have heard of them also. One client did email in and say that they did um, reach out to them via an attorney saying that they're trying to get um, employment at another um, CRO. And, you know, I'm actually going to follow up with them to see what happened with that. Cause hopefully nothing bad happened. Um, but they did reach out to them and uh, through, through mail and say, hey, you got hired at another CRO. This is, our, this is against your non-compete agreement. Um, and I don't know if they did end up reaching out to IQVIA also. Um, so I'm going to have to get some more information on that. But very, very pathetic practice. Um, they're one of the only companies that does this for such low-level employees. Typically, non-competes are for people that may have insider knowledge to how, like for example, a pharmaceutical company may have their lead scientist and scientific team um, sign non-competes because they know their inner workings of the molecules that they're working on and they can go on to another company and be very, very valuable and ruin their business because they know essential um, items about, about the pharmaceutical company. Um, CRAs don't know that. Okay, they don't know essential things. They may know, you know, which products are working a little bit here and there, but they don't know how to make the products and stuff. So absolutely ridiculous practice by MedPace. Um, can't stand them for that. But anyway, you can leave. Um, you just have to go to a, you just have to read the non-compete carefully and see where you can go. Usually if you jump to a different sector, like if you work um, at a pharmaceutical company or you go to the site level, you can kind of get around it. But that's the last one of the first tier jobs. So a bunch of CRA jobs because... Really, those are the type of jobs that um, they'll train you to be because of the demand, and um, they'll, they'll train you to be a CRA, and it's not an entry-level job, typically, um, if you go there from the ground up. So one of the better places to be. Um, the next tier is our second tier slash, you know, true entry-level jobs slash, um, this is where most people start out um, in the clinical research field, and this is probably one of the better places to start out, just because... Um, you really get a strong foundation for how research is conducted and a true understanding of what the jobs are um, at a higher level. So we're going to start out. This is, um, you know, my favorite job, even though I've never done it, but I think you get the most learning from this job. It's hard. It's a lot of work. Um, but my favorite job of this tier is going to be the clinical research coordinator. Now, they do have entry-level clinical research coordinators, and they also have you know, non-entry level, they have senior level clinical research coordinators. You just got to find who's hiring entry level clinical research coordinators. A lot of people email in saying, yo, ECRG, I'm looking for a clinical research coordinator job. However, uh, it seems like they're only looking for people with three and five years experience. And you will find that sometimes, uh, but you just got to keep uh, being patient and keep being aggressive when you're applying because they do have them for entry level people. Uh, plenty of people get started that way. So look out for that. That's one of my favorite jobs in this tier, really in all of clinical research is a clinical research coordinator because they do everything. Um, next job, and this is really a, a great job for those who can get it. It's, it's really a, goes hand in hand if you want to be a CRA, and that's the in-house CRA. So this is another great job, entry level, harder, hard to get, hard to get though, because sometimes it's not entry level. Um, sometimes they do have level twos and threes, and typically, sometimes they do want some experience, but they also do hire in-house CRAs with no experience. So you want to look out for that. The very, very rare. If you can get one, you better, you better take it and then go on to be a CRA after that. So there's not really much um, difference. There's, there's not really, uh, I mean, you're kind of put in one little section of, of the industry when you're an in-house CRA specialist. So you definitely want to make sure you want to be a CRA if you're going to go down that path. Um, that's one of my 
uh, next favorite jobs. And I, I was an in-house CRA for a period of time, so I do know about that job too. Um, next job is a CTA, clinical trial assistant. One of the better jobs because they're very, very uh, common. They do have them. Um, this is one of those jobs that you'll find on the boards a lot. Um, IQVIA has a lot of them. Uh, Docs Icon hires a lot of these people. Um, recruiting firms hire a lot of these people. Shout out to my guys at Aerotech. Um, a lot of recruiting firms will hire clinical trial assistants and then um, kind of place them at CROs for lots of work. So that's a great job just because there's a lot of them and the pay is pretty decent too. Um, and, you know, typically CTAs go on to be in-house CRAs or uh, CRAs or they typically work in project management. So it's a very good role to get your kind of feet in the door of clinical research. Your pay is decent and um, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good little role. And then the next role is going to be your project specialist slash project coordinator. Um, this is a role that's on the project management side typically, so more of a jack of all trades. You're going to be doing some clinical. You're going to be doing some project management. Um, you're going to be dealing with sites a little bit. Um, you're also going to be dealing with you know, project directors and upper level, higher level executives a lot as a project specialist. So um, right-hand man to the project manager is what they are. So if you're interested in project management or just trying to get your foot in the door, great role. I started in this role, this right-hand man to the project manager. Great role to get your feet in the door. Um, can be a little hard to switch over to the clinical side, depending on what time of year and all those things um, you're trying to do it. But it's definitely doable, and it's definitely something um, I recommend that you do. So uh, that's the next tier of jobs. And also the pay is pretty good as a project, as a right-hand person there too. So typically the pay is good in all these roles as a, as a, in clinical research. That's why people like it. The pay is pretty good all around. You'll be able to pay your bills. You'll be able to go on a couple of vacations a year. Um, you know, you'll be able to save your money and do all the things you want to do with your money. Um, pay's decent. And, um, you know, the room for growth is very, very high because of the turnover is high. So, you know, you can pretty much get a promotion every year or every other year. Um, and then the last tier is, you know, a lot of people get their start this way. I don't want to discount this way because, you know, this is kind of short term. Um, and we're talking like a, you know, a six month, three month contract type person. A lot of these roles, they'll bring you in on a contract first before they make you the full time role. Um, so I kind of got my start as a, a project, as a project manager assistant, um, working for a CRO and it was a three month contract. And I think they extended us once for a month. Um, so you're obviously, as soon as you get the job, you're updating your resume and trying to apply to uh, more permanent roles after that. But don't discount those roles, guys. A lot of people get their start in the industry that way. And like I've said many times before, as soon as you get some experience in this industry and you update your resume, it's a whole different ball game. Um, it's a lot easier to get jobs. Um, I had a few offers uh, a couple months after I got my first um, month of experience. So it's a whole game changer after you get some experience. So don't discount those roles. I got started making $11 an hour, $11 an hour, um, doing that, you know, eight hours a day. So it was okay money. I knew it was temporary and it was just to get my foot in the door. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, don't be afraid to get your start. So that's kind of the third tier role. Um, but things move quickly in this industry. you you don't have to be in one of these roles for very long. So as long as you stay aggressive, stay patient, keep your resume updated, uh, keep networking, keep hustling, keep grinding, you'll get to where you want to get to in no time. So that's it, guys. Those are my best jobs uh, for clinical research in 2021. Best entry-level jobs. So that was a mouthful. Hope you guys learned a lot from this episode. As always, if you want any one-on-one -on -one co uh, coaching, consulting, interview prep, or resume review, email me eliteclinicalgroup at gmail.com. Especially if you're in that top tier of job. If you're getting an interview for those top tier jobs, you definitely, you definitely, it's worth the money to go ahead and do some interview prep with me or some career consultation because those jobs are very, very hard to come by and very, very rare for someone with no experience to even have an interview or even have a shot at one of those jobs. So you definitely want to make sure you're putting your best foot forward. So hope this was helpful. Take care, guys.